Hey there everyone. I am uh, making this video to try to bridge some of the information that you'll find in your reference section with some of the information that you're going to find in the articles that you're required to read. So this is uh, my effort to do that. Uh, before I start, since we're just beginning this class, I wanted to say thanks to the, our co-instructor, Dr. John House, um, to Jessica White, the course designer, to uh, Mr. Todd Buecher, who is our videographer, and also to Dr. Clint Stevenson, who is our online course expert and who also funded the grant that allowed this course to, uh, to be created. So with that said, uh, I want to talk about food-based hazards and risks. And the learning outcomes for this particular lesson are uh, to briefly go over hazards and risks, um, to look at toxicity and um, the what, when, where, how, and why, uh, of its occurrence, as well as a little bit of the idea of risk assessment. So things that you'll need to know as you're reading through these papers. So if you looked at the videos, you learned that hazards are potential dangers and risks are uh, related to probability of harm, how likely it is that those hazards are going to do any harm to us. When we classify these things, one way to do it is just to think about the same thing a reporter would think about when they're working on a story the what, the when, the where, the how, and the why. And so here is how I'm classifying these uh, different types of uh, these different types of harmful substances. So in terms of hazards, we can think of toxins and toxicants. And this was uh, on the video. Uh, and just to give you a definition here, toxins being natural and toxicants being man-made. Um, if I use the word toxin throughout the rest of the course, just realize that um, it's just shorthand for both toxins and toxicants. Toxicants has more syllables, so I just may use the word toxin in general, um, but I'll try to be specific. And if I'm pointing out, say, man-made versus natural materials, I'll try, I'll try to specify that. All right, so when can we be harmed by uh, different types of food-based toxins? Well, there are acute toxicities that can occur almost immediately or within hours of consumption of a particular substance. There are chronic to toxicities um, that uh, may require repeated exposures before we, uh, we actually uh, come to any harm from them. And then there are also uh, delayed toxicities where uh, we may experience harm even after maybe one dose, but we may experience harm months or years later after a particular exposure. So there's a very wide variety of ways in which uh, food-related toxins can harm us. And so just to talk briefly about those, uh, in terms of organ systems, pretty much every organ system in our body could be harmed by food toxins. And we could think of something as simple as uh, getting uh, chili peppers into our eyes. Of course, that's a that's a, a temporary thing, but extremely painful if you've ever uh, gotten some pepper spray or something like that in your eyes. Uh, GI uh, tract or digestive tract uh, issues are pretty common, and that's, of course, because we're eating this material. Uh, but these effects can uh, can move to other parts of our bodies as this uh, the toxins may be distributed or reach their target organ. Right, so um, the organ which they actually will affect. Uh, some toxins can affect multiple organs, and so we can uh, see here uh, anything from the pulmonary system, lungs, cardiovascular system, heart, liver, kidneys, and skin. We'll talk more about the uh, the liver uh, during the next uh, next topic as we get into the idea of a dose response and then into um, xenobiotic metabolism. All right. Um, types of harm that can occur at sort of a phenotypic or, or macro level. We can see uh, things like allergic responses, things that are uh, related to immunoglobulin E in terms of their actual mechanism, but what we see is some sort of allergic response. Hives all the way through uh, severe anaphylactic shock where someone has uh, problems breathing. Uh, idiosync idiosyncratic responses. These are uh, inherited metabolic defects that can then manifest themselves when a particular uh, when a particular food is 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 eaten. Um, carcinogenesis um, or cancer, uh, teratogenesis, which is uh, birth defects, uh, neurotoxicity, um, 
and uh, you can see these the others necrosis fibrosis and immune suppression so these are just a few of the phenotype level uh, harms that can result from uh, from hazards in in our foods uh, how do these things actually work so at a basic mechanistic level we can experience free radical damage, uh, highly reactive molecules that can, uh, that can damage different, uh, different types of tissue. We may think about that with relation to uh, highly oxidized lipids um, that, that might be consumed. Alter gene expression, just um, changing the speed at which pathways work faster or slower. Uh, genetic uh, damage or mutation, very often uh, carcinogens work in this way where they uh, cause a particular type of genetic mutation, which then results in, in a cancer eventually. Um, inhibition of tissue repair. So one of the things, um, one of the examples of that would be, say, uh, how death head mushrooms work. So they inhibit our ability to, to do protein synthesis. Once that's inhibited, um, uh, then the ability to repair is, uh, is thus inhibited. And so, um, and so, so death can result as, um, uh, as a result of consumption of, of death's head mushrooms for that reason. Uh, the in inhibition of energy, energy forming pathways. So interfering with oxygen exchange, interfering with the formation of ATP or how mitochondria work. These are all ways in which toxins potentially can work. And we'll see some specific exa examples as we move through the course. Here is a table. I won't uh, bother to read all these, but these are just a few examples, and there are many others uh, that we'll, we will be discussing throughout the semester. But what I wanted to show is just the variety of ways in which toxins can affect us and the ways in which, um, in which many different types of, uh, of foods can have toxic effects. So anything from cucumbers to grilled steaks could potentially have uh, toxic effects, and some of those are related to things that are uh, natural to a uh, particular plant or particular food, um, things like cyanogenic glycosides in elderberries or uh, fructose in fructose-containing foods, and um, all the way through things like benzoipyrene, which would be formed as a result of, say, grilling a steak. So there are a variety of different things that are either present um, naturally in the food or maybe produced as a result of processing that food. And of course, uh, not even listed here, we can think of additives, things that are intentionally or unintentionally incorporated into the, into the foods. Risk assessment, by definition, talks about the idea of looking scientifically at what types of uh, damage or, or adverse health effects might result from exposure to different types of, of hazards. And of course, this applies to food as well. So this idea of risk assessment and developing models of risk assessment arose in, in the US, at least, from the idea that it's impossible to get rid of all things in our diet that might cause um, harm, particularly with regard to cancer. So the Delaney Clause, 1958, indicated that we wanted to eliminate all cancer-causing agents from our diet. That is impossible. Um, so now we understand that the, the key is to minimize risk, not to eliminate it, because that just can't be done. Uh, in the 1970s, the EPA, which was, was established in 1970, um, started developing uh, standards to look at risk assessment. And if you go to their website, you see the link there. You can find out more about what they do. Um, this idea of risk assessment was formally defined in 1983. So again, um, it's been happening for uh, it's been happening for uh, several decades now, and so uh, risk assessment is is uh, further uh, defined in terms of some of the some uh, specific terms that you'll come across in the literature. Things like absolute risk versus relative risk versus odds ratio. So an absolute risk is the idea of uh, the idea of how many events, and these could be good or bad events, but how many, many events might occur relative to, um, relative to the number of people in a population. And then relative risk is uh, the ratio of, uh, of that absolute risk um, for the exposed versus the absolute risk for the uh, unexposed. 
So the idea of being able to get to uh, get to uh, an idea of just how risky something is. You often see relative risk expressed in terms of a number uh, around one. So re relative risk of one means the risk is the same as the general population. So there's no change in risk for an exposure to a particular, in our case, a particular food, if we're talking about food toxicology. Relative risk greater than one means that risk is increased, and the relative risk less than one means a decrease in risk. So you'll see all of those in the toxicology literature. Um, this is the most desirable way of expressing risk, um, but it deals typically with large populations and uh, forward-looking studies where you design a population to look out through time where people start without disease and then they end up with a disease and you ask about the risk that that occurred those are expensive so what is also done um, is the calculation of what are called odds ratios so the idea of odds ratios is the odds that an, a disease person was exposed versus uh, the odds that a healthy person was exposed. And these are derived from case control studies, which, uh, which can be much smaller than these large cohort studies, much less expensive. And also they're retrospective. They look back in time. So you could even say look back through uh, death records and start to look at um, some of, uh, and start to calculate odds ratios. There's a video here um, that you can look at to see specific calculations for relative risk versus odds ratio, um, just so you can see exactly how that would look. All right, um, in terms of general steps, there are four steps to risk assessment uh, for human health, and these would certainly apply to, uh, to exposures related to food. Um, you have to identify a hazard, something that, that may be harmful. You then look at a, a dose response, and this is done typically in multiple ways. Um, everything from uh, in vitro uh, type studies, perhaps uh, modeling using uh, computers through animal uh, animal testing, and um, and then you assess the exposure. Uh, how how much how often is the human population exposed to this particular potential hazard, and then you characterize the risk uh, in terms of just how. Uh, dangerous this particular uh, this particular hazard might be. So here's another look uh, at this idea and what I want to emphasize here is that uh, risk risk assessment is really uh, in the middle of this sandwich of basic research and risk management. So at one end we have basic research and this is what happens in the lab as um, whether you know you're you're at the, the bench in the lab or you're out in the field collecting samples trying to get an idea of, of what types of hazards might be out there or in the case of, of, uh, say, of say foods you might go to the field, you might go to the grocery store, you might go to a variety of places collect those foods and try to figure out where those hazards or potential dangers are. Uh, you're looking to see um, what types of exposures might, might happen, how often and then trying to determine the mechanisms by which those things might be harmful. All right, so now you've, you've identified something as, as, uh, as harmful if you're exposed, there's a hazard. Now, doing the risk assessment looks at, uh, looks at okay, the hazard is, is there, yes or no? If it's there, let's do a dose response and estimate how often um, uh, and how frequently you're exposed. Let's characterize the risk. What that moves into then is actual regulations. You have to make rules around, uh, around the idea of a risk and that relates to public health and the economy. And so uh, as we have indicated before, you can't say that we want zero risk because that's, that's really impossible. Um, it's, often, uh, it's often more and more expensive to get lower and lower risk. So at a certain point, you have to start making decisions about how how costly do you want this intervention or avoidance to be, and that gets to uh, that gets to public policy and to politics. So very often uh, we're moving uh, from basic uh, laboratory research and then into um, into areas where there may be uh, hearings in Congress or something like that, uh, looking at this this risk management piece. So just to give you an idea of where risk assessment fits. All right. Um, 
one uh, other piece to the puzzle here is risk perception. So the idea is uh, there is, if we, could, if we could calculate it, if we had enough uh, time and, and money and resources, we could calculate risk for a wide variety of things. That's one thing. That's sort of the, the, the science part. But then there's also the psychology component where um, how risky do you perceive something to be or do, does a population perceive something to be? Well, um, I've laid it out here in terms of quadrants. If you look at, if you look at some at things uh, in terms of being observable um, and controllable versus not observable and not controllable, uh, what we see in general is that those things that are both observable and controllable, even if they're dangerous, like drinking and driving or texting and driving, we can see these things happening. We can also control them uh, in terms of whether we do those or not. Those tend to be uh, more accepted um, because they are both observable and controllable. Um, they are dangerous, but, uh, but more accepted than things that are, for instance, not observable, but controllable, uh, whether water is fluorinated, fluoridated or not, uh, right? The presence of fluoride in water. Um, also, uh, things that are observable, but not controllable, like natural disasters, depending on where you are, um, you might have different levels of perceived uh, risk. Um, and of course, depending on whether a natural disaster uh, just happened or is happening, uh, will certainly change your perception. Now, the, the, the category where we have the highest risk perception is the things that are not observable, we can't see them, and they're not controllable. So the idea of, uh, the idea of things that we, we can't really see and we, uh, we can't really control, the unknown uh, tends to create the greatest risk perception. So the, the, the take home here is that um, is that risk perception isn't always in line with what actually is the greatest risk or the greatest danger to us. And that certainly applies as uh, with, regard to, with regard to food. So the take-homes here are, uh, one, that many food-based hazards exist, um, that risk can be reduced but cannot be eliminated, and risk assessment is a way to determine uh, risk relative to our exposure. And of course, we saw that there are different types of terms, um, absolute risk, relative risk, and odds ratio that are related to these assessments. Um, uh, lastly, that risk assessment is an intermediary between um, basic research and risk management um, so that it's, it's, part of a, it's part of a larger whole. So I just want you to, to understand those things. All right. Well, thanks for listening, and we will see you next time.